All right, let's continue uh, while we wait for the last people. Let's, so I, I got a few questions that clarified that I perhaps should address something right away. So, um, so I, I'm using the notation A for a matrix in, uh, you know, it's, it's context dependent. On some slides it means something and uh, it should be reasonably coherent within the lecture. But uh, notice that in the last lecture, a was always a matrix that maps sources in one region to targets somewhere else. So this is the matrix. These, these are the types of matrices that have rapidly decaying singular values. They're extremely ill-conditioned, as ill-conditioned as they can possibly be. That's different from the matrices that you get when you discretize, say, a boundary into an equation. So say A here is a discretization of a boundary into equation. This matrix should not have rapidly decaying singular values. It should ideally have more or less constant singular values. Uh, if it's a single layer operator, you know, it, they might have some mild decay. But this is a matrix that whose objective it is for us to invert later. So the idea is not that you should use the idea or anything directly on this whole thing that all these low rank compression techniques be applied to off diagonal blocks of such a matrix. So the last lecture, it was talking about techniques for handling off diagonal blocks, really, or small representations of off diagonal blocks, even. So we're not even going to look at, we're never really going to form huge big chunks of this matrix. We're just going to look at small pieces of it. And for those, we're going to use basically dense compression techniques, things that have complexity, at least the number of elements in the matrix. Then, of course, for A, we're going to need clever techniques, things that scale ideally linearly with the number of degrees of freedom. So the purpose of the next lecture is to give a brief introduction to uh, structured matrix computation, specifically to rank structured matrices. And this topic, I found, it, it's a little bit dense. It's a little bit hard to access initially. So what, what I decided to do is I've split it. So this first part, we'll see. It's very hard to guess how times work out. But my intention is to spend about half an hour on it now, just to introduce some hopefully not too uh, challenging concepts. And then. Uh, we can play around with them yesterday, uh, tomorrow a little bit. And then we'll return on Thursday. So what I'm introducing today is what we're going to need to construct direct solvers for sparse matrices, things that arise when you discretize using finite differences or finite elements. And then on Thursday, these techniques will not quite be adequate. So then we're going to introduce another layer, slightly more complicated matrix representations. and. Uh, yeah, ju just so you know. So th this is going to be fairly superficial, in part because I wanted to break it up in two parts. But even in, in the entire five lectures, we'll never really go into details about structured matrix computations, because it's, it's a fairly obstreperous topic. But uh, basically, so, so, rank, so there's a concept of a matrix having structure. And by that, I really only mean that you know, there's less than n squared complexity in it. So you can store it in less than n squared floating point numbers, or you can apply it to a matrix in less than n squared operations, something like this. So a general matrix, you know, all these things scale as n squared, the matrix is square. Then uh, some cases of structured matrices that are well known is the sparse matrices. So you only have k non-zero elements on a row. This is certainly a type of structure. In this case, you can do a matrix vector multiply in kn operations. You can have things that uh, are in principle dense, but there's not that much information in it. So you only have one row that's a little bit shifted as you go down in the matrix. In that case, if you store just one row, you, you've stored the entire matrix, basically. And in order to get a fast algorithm for this, you just move to Fourier space. So if it's a circulant, so the things that are pushed out at one end are being refed at the other end. Then it's diagonal in Fourier space, and you can apply it very rapidly using the FFT. And then the case we've talked about a fair amount is uh, when A has uh, rank K. In this case, you can, of course, apply the matrix in cost K 
k times n, specifically two times k times n floating point operations. And then um, the topic of this lecture is to take a slightly more general look at things like an FMM matrix. So here, the matrix A here is what you get. You know, so in the FMM, where you can view the FMM as executing a matrix vector multiply involving a dense matrix. And this is the shape of the matrix elements if you're doing Laplace in two dimensions. And as we saw, this can be evaluated in O of n operations. So this is certainly a structured matrix. More specifically, it's what we call rank structured. So the specific structure of A is that its octagonal blocks have low rank. So in the presentation of the FMM we did, we didn't, we didn't really cast things that way. We took a very physics approach to it and cast everything as outgoing expansions, incoming expansions, you know, multiple expansions. And uh, you know, we, we viewed it from the point of view of physics. You could have done everything we did on the fast multiple method. We could have also done in a purely linear algebraic way. The ones you established that the off-diagonal blocks have low rank, then we could have cast everything in terms of linear algebra. Notationally, that's, I find, much more complicated, so I didn't want to present it that way. But uh, in some of the things we're going to do, taking the linear algebraic approach is going to be more clear, I believe. Okay, so here again is the SVD, just um, a little reminder of the notation we use. So U's are the left singular vectors, V's are the right singular vectors, just as before. And we're going to introduce, we've, we've done it sort of indirectly, but there's this notion of epsilon rank. If you give a tolerance, then how many singular values do you need to include in order to approximate the matrix of tolerance epsilon? Here I'm assuming I'm using a spectral norm on the matrix. And uh, it's really, you're looking at the singular values, look at how, which one do you need to pick to get it to be less than epsilon, and then that's the epsilon rank, K. All right. So the type of structured matrices we're going to describe in this lecture, it's extremely simplistic. It's really the simplest class of rank structured matrices pretty much. And uh, it's just, if you take a matrix like this, I'm going to say that it's rank structured if you formally do some sort of hierarchical tessellation of it. So I take the big matrix, at first I just cut it into four quadrants, and then the condition has to be that the off-diagonal blocks here have low rank. And then I want that property to be true recursively. So then each one of the two diagonal blocks also have to have this property. All right, so the first thing we're going to do, so whenever I make a statement like that, this is to some preset precision. So you give me some computational precision, say 10 to the minus 10. Um, and then uh, that leads to rank. So, you know, for, for any matrix, what I just said is true if you allow the rank here to be n half. Say. So for this to be a meaningful concept, the rank has to be low. Uh, so we say that it's an, I, I call this S matrix format. It, it's just a completely made up term. Don't use it. It's <laughs> just for purposes of these lectures. Um, I don't think, I don't know if they ha even have a standard name. It's, they're not super useful from. No, HSS is more. I, I call it HOD now. Yeah, I guess you could call it an H matrix. It's a special type of H matrix. Right. Holder matrix. The holder matrix? Oh. Yeah, but I, yeah. But it's for specific tessellation. It's not anything off the diagonal. Yes? You could call it a symmetric arc, arc, arc tree. Yes. Yes. No. <laughs> we, we, we can call it many things. I am going to call it an S matrix. But the, the only point of this little comment was, you know, don't, don't use this term. And it's not an established term, is really all I'm trying to say here. So what I'm going to do is um, at first, so you see I've labeled these things in a way that at first might look slightly quirky. Why is that A3, 2? And why is this A10, 10? 10? 
So I, I want to introduce this notation. Th this notation will be very useful, and we're going to see it a lot in coming lectures, so let's do this carefully. So what's going on here is that all these tessellations, they're, they're based on some sort of hierarchical partitioning of the index of the indices for the matrix. So suppose just for simplicity that the matrix is of size 400 by 400. Then what I'm doing is I'm taking the entire index vector 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 400. I'm calling this I1. So this is going to be the root of a tree. Okay, so here's the big index vector I1. This contains all the indices. And then I'm going to split it into two. So we have I2 and I3. Like this. And then you just continue to split recursively. So then we split. I want to have these numbers on the board. That's why I'm drawing them. I4, I5, I6, I7. And exactly which way you order them doesn't really matter. Like the algorithm will not. You could call these anything. So you could call them alpha, beta, gamma, or you know, made up some code words. These indices don't have any particular meaning. They're just labels. So they, they don't really imply anything about which order we're going to traverse the tree or anything like this. And uh, yeah. so this is a tree on the index vector. Like this, we're going to go one more level. Etc. up to I15. All right, is everybody with me? All right, so now, given two index vectors, we're going to define A sigma tau to be a sublog of A. Okay, so just like this. So now, this would be a sigma tau. So now I hope they should clarify the notation in this figure. So notice that the only matrices I care about here, right, so there's the diagonal blocks on the finest level. So you, you pick some rank and you keep subdividing until the blocks, the, until the leaves are sort of comparable to the rank. At that point, you know, there's no point in continuing. So now the off-diagonal blocks all have rank at most k, which means that they can be stored efficiently. Notice that the only ones I care about, so th there's no matrix A413. That, you know, the box corresponding to 4 and 13 doesn't have any meaning here. The only pairs, the only off-diagonal blocks I care about are the ones associated with sibling pairs. So four and five are siblings because they have the same parent. Two and three are siblings. They have the same parent. So all off-diagonal blocks that I care about are associated with a sibling pair. All right. So if you have this type of mat uh, matrix, you can now do uh, matrix vector multiply very cheaply. So suppose. Uh, so how does this work? Suppose I'm given this matrix A. I have the compressed representations of all the off-diagonal blocks. And now I'm given a vector x. I want to compute A times x. How do I do it? Well, let's uh, apply the blocks level by level. So at the coarsest level, I multiply by these two big diagonal blocks, like this. So in the previous slide, I, initially, I set B to 0. So also, I'm using the notation B of tau is simply a subset of the vector B. OK, so first I multiply by these two blocks. Then I multiply by these two blocks, add their contributions. 
and then you just continue like this. Notice that all these steps are completely independent. So I'm presenting them sequentially now, but you can do them in any order. You can do them in parallel. This type of representation is very easy. The diagonal blocks you have to do explicitly. All right, so this is uh, what the algorithm looks like. And uh, again, what we'll use, you, we're going to see this type of sort of pseudocode a lot. So I wanted to go slow in introducing the notation. So notice again that sigma 1 and sigma 2, they always come in sibling pairs. But these interactions are always between siblings. Was there, uh, did I describe the cost anywhere? No. Ah, right, here. Yeah, thank you. So let's see. So how does this work? So the, the overall cost here of the matrix vector multiply, I'm arguing, is n log n times k. And how do I arrive at that? Well, applying these two big blocks. So they are of size n half. And the rank is k. And recall doing a matrix vector multiply of a matrix of size Q, say, and rank K is Q times K. So the cost of applying one of these big blocks is N half times K, and there are two other blocks. Then on the next level, there are four blocks. So that's these two, five, four, four, five, six, seven, and seven, six. There are four of those, but they're a quarter the size. And then continue down. So the cost of processing one level, so to speak, one size of blocks is the same. There are log n levels at most, so the overall cost here is n log n times k. So the, the thing I'm saving for Thursday is how do you get rid of this log n factor? That's the, the next more sophisticated was so this HSS or HBS matrices. So then there, there are more conditions on the ranks and then you get more efficient algorithms. Yeah, where were we? Right, so what I'm not going to talk about today is how to actually find the factors in the sibling pairs. This turns out to be, uh, to be really where a lot of the meat in these algorithms are. So it, it's going to be context dependent. On Wednesday, we're going to talk about direct solvers for sparse matrices. And then you actually build these matrices up little by little. So the question never really arises. When dealing with integral equations, we're given a big dense matrix. So some huge big thing. I want to compute all these off all these low rank representations. And obviously I cannot what I cannot do is I cannot form this big matrix of size n by n and numerically compress it. That would be n squared cost immediately. So I have to avoid that somehow. And that really is a major bottleneck in devising direct solvers for integral equations. All right, you can also represent things recursively. So for the MATVEC, you know, the linear algorithm is very simple. This is what it looks like. Uh, by linear, I mean the, the one where you roll it out. You do all the iterations as a loop. We can have a much shorter loop if we allow things to be recursive. Of course, for the matrix, there's no point. If you can, you probably should avoid recursive coding because it's just hard to keep track of. It's hard to parallelize and so on. But uh, it's sometimes very convenient. It saves you a lot of work. So the matrix looks like this if you express it recursively. So if uh, you're given an input matrix that's small, then just do it by brute force. Otherwise, apply the off-diagonal blocks associated with the input matrix and then send the two diagonal blocks back into the same recursion. Right. That's a two one. Ah, right. right. Yes. Thank yeah. you. All <coughs> um, right. So for matrix vector multiply, there's not much point in writing it recursively. Now, suppose we want to invert instead. So this, for this matrix, the what I call the S matrices, they're very easy to invert. This is. The, their main advantage, I would say. 
So there's a, a number of ways to go about this. So for instance, we have this formula for the inverse of a two by two block matrix. So you can write it out like this. And what you see here is that the, the, the nice, what's nice, so this is a slightly messy formula, but what's nice about it is that it recasts the problem of inverting a matrix of size n by n as a task of inverting two matrices of half the size. So look at this. So what I need to do here is I need to first invert A22. So it's a matrix of half the size. Then once I have A22, I can compute the matrix S11. It's also sized n half by n half. And then if I can invert S11, I just plug it back in here. And now A12 is a matrix of low rank. So then evaluating all this stuff is cheap. Okay, so the point here is that for an S matrix, we can write this recursive formula that's based on uh, this matrix identity. And uh, the complexity here is uh, n times n power of log n. So th this is not a very efficient algorithm, especially if you implement it recursively. So these are implemented in MATLAB codes that I put on the website. So this is something you can take a look at. And for these matrices, the MATLAB codes are all written recursively. Because it's very easy to it's it's very easy to code and it, it's sort of accessible. But it, trying to roll things out, things get messier. Okay. But uh, even if we allow ourselves to do recursive stuff, this is still a little bit unpleasant because this formula has the property that I have to first process one quadrant and wait until this one is done, and then I process the other one. So it's a very directional recursion. Let's see if we can get around that. So there are other formulas for inverting two by two block matrices. Uh, something that's particularly appealing to us is, of course, variations of the Woodbury formula. So the Woodbury formula is really for how to invert. If you have a matrix D, that for some reason is easy to invert. It doesn't matter how. Suppose just by whatever means you can easily invert it. And then you have a low rank update to it. So I'm assuming here that A tilde is a small matrix. So the setup is A is big, but it can be decomposed. Like this. Okay. So remember that inverting dense matrices is very expensive. It scales as n cubed. So any reduction in the size is very helpful. So suppose I want to invert A. Now if I can write it as something D, I mean the term D is to imply you know diagonal or something like this. Diagonal matrix is certainly easy to invert. And then we have a low rank update to it. So then the Woodbury formula tells me exactly what the inverse of A is. It's simply the inverse of D plus then a low rank update, which takes this form. So here, in order to compute this low rank update, all I need to do is invert this much smaller matrix of size k by k. So this is what the Woodbury formula does for you. How does this apply to uh, S matrices? Well, so suppose we have factorizations here. So on the board. All right, so the off-diagonal blocks can be written like this. So the off-diagonal blocks of A I now factor. So we have A11, U1, like this. And then the splitting here so I pull out the diagonal blocks
Right. So an S matrix is in a format that's very convenient to the Woodbury formula. So we have this splitting into four quadrants. I pull out the diagonal blocks, because now it it's gets much easier to invert. If nothing else, I've cut the size in half, which even if I'm using it just dense operations, I've gained a factor eight. Well, there are two of them, so I've gained a factor four. Um, right, and then there's the low rank update, like this. If you work the details out, you get the following expression for the inverse of A. So it's the inverses of the diagonal blocks and then a low rank update. But now notice the advantage of this formula over the one on the previous slide. And then now I, I can process the two big diagonal blocks independently. I don't have to wait with processing one while the other one is being handled. Okay, so so th this is really, this is really all I wanted to say in this lecture. Let, let's start slowly, and you can play with these things in the MATLAB codes that I shared, if you like. And then on Thursday, we're going to talk about how to get rid of the log factors. So that adds one more level of complexity, and I wanted to give you a chance to familiarize yourself with the notation before we get there. All right. So the HBS and HSS matrices, we, we can discuss them using much of the same notation as we introduced in this lecture. It's based on exactly the same binary trees, tessellations of the matrices, and so on. Okay, before we close this topic, let's just make one comment that's going to be a recurring point. So notice that the FMM is not, so the low rank representation of a matrix that's implicit in the FMM is not at all of this type. It's not what I call an S matrix. And the reason here is it's, it's very hard to draw these things because you have orderings in physical space and then you have the layout of the matrices. So the only case that's easy to handle is when physical space is one dimensional because then sort of relations in physical space sort of corresponds to relations in index space. So in, in for one dimensional problems, you could write an FMM matrix by which I mean really just the, the low rank tessellation of the matrix that's implicit by the FMM. You can write it out like this. So the red blocks here correspond to the nearby interactions that are done by brute force. And then the more far away you are, you handle the interactions via multiple expansions on as high levels as appropriate. You want to use as big boxes as you can get away with while respecting this condition on points being well separated from the boxes. Right. So it corresponds to a tessellation like this. And uh, now notice that if I try to use this little trick, this uh, Woodbury formula to this matrix, you can do it. But it, it's much harder because now I don't have this self-similarity anymore. That A11 doesn't really have the same structure as the entire matrix. That's a minor problem. A much worse problem is that the off-diagonal blocks themselves now have a lot of internal rank. Right? So you can handle this, but the coding is messier. And uh, th this, is, this is really one of the main decisions you have to make in designing direct solvers. Do you want to enforce this buffering where you don't compress blocks that immediately touch? If you enforce buffering, you get much lower ranks. It's much easier to compress things, but the inversion algorithms get messier. So it's really a trade-off. All right. Any questions? I'm, I'm going to continue with a different topic. So this is a good point to ask questions if there's anything about structured matrices. So it's, is there a way to see why the Woodbury version of inverting this S format allows you to do things in parallel? Why does sort of independent calculations, whereas in the first case you didn't? I just can't picture that. <laughs> um. But it does, and you say it does, so you can do a lot of these independently. Yes, I mean, it's, I, I don't have anything terribly intelligent to say about this. I mean, it, it, all these linear algebraic computations 
you can fiddle with the loops and see, you know, which ones can you break apart. And th there are different formulations that mathematically lead to the same answer, but the data flow is different. I'm not sure I have anything very illuminating to say about this. So, so is that the first approach to complement and the second one you just use the low rank decomposition so that they're separate? Yes. Yes, you know, there's, there's differences between, you can use LU decomposition, so you can compute inverses. And so the first approach, just because it's a true complement, you just yeah. inverted A22, so A11 inverse, test on that. Yes. But, but you didn't use the low rank of the not diagonal. Uh, okay. No, I, so I, I did. Both formulas rely crucially on the fact that the octagonal law are the right. Yeah. Question? Can yes. you go back to your linear one dimensional? So if I had a 3D problem or 2D problem, mm -hmm. I could construct the space filling curve, which I could then stretch out. Yes. Does that mapping work with this? Yes, so it helps. So you can, okay, so if you want to lay out the matrix to minimize communication, if this is your computational domain, you have the points. Okay, so these are boxes in a computational domain. Okay, so the easy thing is to just number them like this, right? Right, this is the first thing you think about. But in this case, you, you have very poor relationship between closeness and index space and closeness and physical space. You can do it a little bit better. So, yes, so the, the idea of face, space filling curves here would be that, say, we block, we number one quadrant at a time. So we can do, you know, one, two, three, four, and then we do five, six, Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and by doing this kind of stuff, I, I could go down more levels. And in principle, in the limit, it would be a space filling curve. But it doesn't completely solve the problem because what do we get? So now this is thirteen. So you see, three and ten touch, but they're still far away in physical space. Uh, they're far away in index space, but they're close in uh, index space. So there, there's not a way to do it perfectly. You, you cannot, sort of, the space filling curve, it's not a perfect way. It works for certain things, so mapping 1D into 2D, but it has various drawbacks. So you, you can do, it does help to order things the right way, but it doesn't resolve the problem. Is there a reason why the one end block is high end? Oh, yeah, I, I guess I had in mind a periodic domain when I drew the figure. Yeah, that's, that, that, if, if I did have a, yes, for this potential, the figure is wrong, actually, you're right. Anything else? Yes? And what about the error? <coughs> so because you're doing a lot of, like, uh, you have a lot of approximations. When you uh, compute the inverse, you yes. have a lot of multiplication of approximation as well. Yes. So I guess you have like a log factor appearing there. Right. So, yeah, so this is an excellent question. So, yes. So the approximation I do when I approximate the matrix with something that's rank structured, just doing the norm between the matrix and its rank structured approximation, that's pretty straightforward. You know, if you have a local truncation error, they aggregate in certain ways, but very, very mildly. But then once you throw it into one of these inversion formulas, then you're truncating at every level. And these errors can aggregate. So this is something that one has to pay very close attention to. And uh, this is partially understood. So for instance, if the matrix is uh, you know, symmetric positive definite or something like this, and you use orthonormal basis, you, if U and V are orthonormal matrices, then you can show quite a lot about how error aggregation is very mild. For some of the things I'm going to show you, it's really purely based on heuristics. 
We observe computationally that errors don't aggregate, but I've, I've tried hard to prove it, and I don't know how. It's <laughs> so uh, so my, my thinking on this is, you know, whenever having theory to support your algorithms is extremely valuable. Whenever you can, you absolutely should. But it, it's okay if you don't, as long as you're conscientious about it. So if you don't have theory, you should be very meticulous about incorporating error controls. So you can do various types of randomized sampling to estimate the error after the computation. Yep. Anything else? No? Okay, so then the next thing I was going to talk about um, concerns randomized methods for compressing matrices. So one of the things we're going to talk about now is so I, we, we made this claim that the sort of standard cost, if you have an, a square matrix of size n, you want to compute the rank k approximation to it. Normally, it costs n squared k. One of the things these randomized methods will do for you is that you can reduce this k to log k and actually do it more than a vague computer science sense. You can actually get real speed ups for normal problem sizes. So that's one of the motivations. But uh, there are actually a lot of applications of these randomized methods. Of course, my main objective here is to use them in direct solvers. But I will allow myself to just broaden the discussion just for this one lecture a little bit, because the techniques are they're applicable to a broad class of matrices. So why you know, be unnecessarily restrictive? Um, right, so I'm going to talk about this uh, basic linear algebraic problem. Given a matrix A of size m by n, how do you compute a low-rank approximation to it? Um, for the purpose of direct solvers, oftentimes we need another decomposition, something like the interpolative decomposition. And we're going to talk about that as well. But the, the basic machinery is the same, regardless of which low-rank approximation you want. It turns out that once you have one of them, it, it's quite easy to massage the factors to get another one. OK. so. One of the applications here we have in mind are precisely the matrices that arise in direct solvers. They fit in RAM. They are very rapidly singular, decaying singular values. But the slight generalization I'm going to do just in this lecture is uh, to also consider very large matrices whose singular values do not decay very rapidly. So randomized methods turn out to be very efficient for processing such matrices as well. And uh, so the, the first thing. So I'm, I'm addressing a very classical problem here. I want to have a low rank factorization of a given matrix. This is you know, something that's been studied a very long time. So why revisit it? Because existing algorithms work, you know, they, they work extremely nicely. MATLAB is a wonderful tool. Um, so, uh, so one of the reasons is what I started with. That even though existing algorithms work wonderfully, they can still be improved upon. So we can actually accelerate them by a substantial factor in certain cases. But uh, the more pressing reason here is really that uh, computational architectures have changed a lot. So if we can design linear algebraic tools that are very low communication costs, then that turns out to be, to be very beneficial. Even if the flop count is the same or even slightly higher, minimizing communication is critical. And uh, these randomized methods have proven very helpful in this regard. Uh, so there's a bunch of prior work on randomized sampling of matrices. For um, details, we published a survey article a few years ago. It has a very careful literature review. So I will simply refer to that. And um, right, so let's uh, restate before we describe the algorithm. I'm going to just restate the objectives. For the most part, I'm going to talk about computing singular value decompositions. But everything applies to computing, say, an interpolative decomposition as well. If you have an SVD, it's easy to get an interpolative decomposition. All right. So for once, this is very, I, I like giving this talk because I can give the algorithm very early. It's a very easy algorithm. So I'm going to give it very early on, and then we're going to discuss the costs and look at its performance. So it has two steps. So the randomized part, I'm going to use simply to construct the basis for the column space of the matrix. 
and uh, we express this like this. So A is the input matrix. So the randomized part will resolve this red box. We'll form, we're going to construct K orthonormal basis vectors collected into a matrix Q that has the property that A is approximately equal to Q times Q transpose A, which is to say that the columns of Q accurately span the columns of A. Once you've done that, you've essentially solved the problem. After that, you can go and compute an ID, you can compute an SVD, you can compute an LU factorization. This is what it looks like to do uh, an SVD. So what we do is we take the big matrix A, we project it down and compute its representation in the basis provided by the Q vectors. Then you get a small matrix. Okay, so A is big. Maybe I should write this down. Okay, so this is A. It's M by N. Q is M by K. So then the matrix B up here is Q transpose A. It's a matrix that looks like that. It's K by N. Okay, so now K is small. What I have in mind here is that k is 50 or 100 or something like this. So now I can easily compute the SVD of b. And the cost is k squared times m. So th this is quite cheap if k is small. So we use a brute force computation on this smaller matrix b. And then you just project it back up to uh, the big space by multiplying the left singular vectors of b by the matrix q. And then you get the approximation to the left singular vectors of A. Notice that in exact arithmetic, the last three steps are exact. So this is just, this is really just a manipulation. We're massaging the factors without changing anything, really, other than floating point arithmetic. And here we're using dense algebra, which, you know, it, it's very precise. And um, this is. The, the overall pattern here is the same as what numerical analysis textbooks tell you to do. If, if you're given a matrix whose singular values decay rapidly, you want to rank k factorization to it, you should do precisely this. But what the textbook says is that you execute the first step using, for instance, a rank revealing QR factorization. Or in many cases, a plain QR factorization works just fine. Okay. So we're go but we're going to do this. We're going to do the first steps a little bit differently. So what we're going to do is this. So our objective is to find the basis for the column space of A. So what I'm doing is, so I have my big matrix A. Now I'm going to draw a vector at random in Rn, a vector of random direction. So Gaussian is very convenient because it samples all directions evenly. It's a perfectly uniform distribution in terms of direction. So draw a Gaussian vector then multiply it into A. What I get coming out is one vector from the column space of A. Right? Now, continue. So now, I, I now have one, once I've normalized this guy, I have one basis vector for the column space. I know for a fact it's with 100% certainty in the range of A. It's in the column space of A. Okay, how do I span the rest of it? Well, I draw one more sample. So draw a second random vector, omega 2, multiply it into A, and this gives me a second sample from the column space. So this is going to be a little bit different from the first one. I want an orthonormal basis. So now I just execute Gram-Schmidt, so I orthonormalize. So I move my second vector a little bit, and I normalize it. So now Q1 and Q2 are an orthonormal basis that spans the same space as y1 and y2. Right. Suppose initially that A has exact rank k. In that case, so something that could derail this is if, uh, say, y1 and y2 are parallel. But the likelihood of that turns out to be 0. So if A has exactly rank k, then for the first k samples I draw, they are not going to be parallel. 
they are going to be slightly you know, spread out. So that in principle, once I orthonormalize, I will get an orthonormal basis for the range of A. If A has precise rank K, then with probability 1, the first K samples I draw will be linearly independent, which means that once I orthonormalize them, I would get K vectors for which I know for a fact that they're in the range. If the range has dimension k, they must be an orthonormal basis. So I succeed with probability 1. Now, there are, there are two concerns about this, or at least two concerns about this process. So one is that, of course, in general, most matrices do not have exact rank k. So there's going to be much Okay, so we want to find, so the ideal basis consists of the first left singular vectors of A. So I want to sample richly from these. But of course, in real life, there are more singular vectors that have non-zero weights. So they are going to be mixed into the samples that I draw. So the samples that I draw, they're not going to be perfect samples. They're going to have contributions from these singular vectors I really don't want. So that's one issue. Another issue is uh, conditioning. That even though with probability 1, this is a mathematical statement, that they will, with probability 1, not be collinear. But they will cluster around the leading singular vectors. So from the point of view of numerical analysis, this sounds very bad. The vectors y1, y2, up to yk, they do mathematically form a basis for the column space, but it, it's a very bad matrix. It's a very bad basis because it's very ill-conditioned. But it turns out that it, it's very accurate in the directions that you care about. So once you orthonormalize, you're going to have very poor accuracy in directions associated with small singular values. But this, it turns out, it doesn't matter. As long as the only thing you care about is the norm difference between A and this approximation Q, Q transpose A. If you wanted to have good approximations to the singular vectors associated with small singular values that have high, pre high relative precision, then this would perform very poorly. But in many applications, you don't. Specifically in the direct solvers, you don't need that. All we need is uh, a good bound on A minus Q, Q transpose A. So it seems like the algorithmic, algorithmic requirements on A are very similar to what you might see for like an Arnoldi process. I wonder if you could maybe compare and contrast what it mean. Whereas the Arnoldi process, I think, sort of has a little bit more feedback built into it in the sense that you deliberately try to build the process. Yeah, no, I, I will. Uh, why that can get lower. Yes. Is there a there, there are, yes. Th that will come in later slides. Okay. Yeah. Because later on, I am going to tweak the randomized method to do some feedback as well, actually. So we'll, we'll talk about this. Uh, so, so this is, it's a complement to Arnoldi. It's not intended to replace Arnoldi. It's, you know, it's uh, something that sometimes works better and sometimes works less well. Um, all right, so the main point, the, the sort of surprising underlying empirical observation here is that even if, um, Uh, what happened? All ah, right, here's the surprising, perhaps surprising observation. That even in the case where the matrix does not have exact rank k, it turns out that it does reasonably well. So the contributions from the singular vectors you don't want, it's, it's modest. It's in particular for this case that we have in direct solvers where the singular values decay exponentially, it turns out that this method works beautifully. It's, it works almost as well as the SVD, and it works essentially as well as an interpolative decomposition, and it's much cheaper. Right. For the case where the singular values decay very slowly, we are going to need to use some sort of Arnoldi-inspired ideas. Right. So this is exactly the same algorithm, just written in matrix form. So of course, this, the way I describe the algorithm of drawing individual vectors, this is computationally very inefficient. We don't want to do BLAST2 when we can do BLAST3, basically. So draw all the samples at once and do matrix matrix multiplies. So I think really this way, much better. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's exactly right. Um, right. 
So here's the algorithm. These are the, the first three steps, so the ones that I had obscured earlier. And uh, here's the MATLAB code. I should mention also that implementations of these algorithms are on the website, so you can play around with this if you like. Right, so here's the code. This is the full algorithm. And uh, we're later just going to discuss a tweak for when the singular values decay slowly, but this is basically it. For purposes of direct solvers, this is really what we're going to use. This is, we're going to use just this basic one. And uh, here's the corresponding algorithm for computing an ID, which is even easier. Um, right, so here I, this is not a standard MATLAB command, obviously. So it's an uh, interpolative decomposition. So it takes an input matrix uh, Y and it computes, its output is on the one hand, this matrix that, um, so U here is the matrix. It's a tall, thin matrix with a K by K identity matrix in it. And J is an index vector that points to which are the good K rows in this case. So this is an interpolative decomposition based on picking rows. So notice that in this case, we don't even really need the orthonormalization step. You just compute the sample matrix, and then you compute an ID directly of the sample matrix. So it's a very simple algorithm to implement. You can, uh, I'm not going to spend much time on this slide, but just if you look at this algorithm, we visit A twice. So the main advantage here is that it's pass efficient. You have few, it accesses A in a very structured way. So first we do the sampling, and then we project A down to the basis that we computed. It turns out with some modifications, if you sample, if you, in the sample stage, construct both the basis for the row space and for the column space, then you can actually do away with this second step. And uh, you can get a single pass algorithm so this is quite interesting if you work with streaming data or something like this. But it doesn't really relate to our case in direct solvers, so I'm not really going to spend time on this. Um, OK, so in the presentation so far, I assume that the rank is known in advance. This is, of course, not generally the case in practice. So this can be dealt with. So what you do is, uh, you oversample by a fair amount. You take an, uh, some sort of guess, an upper guess for the rank. And uh, it, it's very cheap to do. If the rank is 50, you might as well guess 100. And then the algorithm will determine the actual rank for you. If you have no idea, then you, know, you can step it up. There are various strategies for doing this. You can preserve a lot of the asymptotic complexity. But uh, in the case of direct solvers, you usually have some sort of rough idea what the rank is in advance. It's, it's less than 500, say it's 237. And the algorithm will answer with 237 or maybe 240, but you, know, you can give it as input just the upper bound. OK, so let's discuss costs on this algorithm. So as I mentioned, it accesses the original matrix twice. So first you compute the samples, and then you do the projection down. So this involves matrix matrix multiplies involving A and A star. So I need to be able to apply these two matrices. Then the remaining steps are dense operations on matrices that have at most K columns or K rows. So, right, so typically this cost is dominated by the steps that involve A. Because if A is dense, ah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll do it systematically. So this is, this is a case we're typically going to address when using direct solvers. So this is when A is just, you know, it's, it's the first environment you think of. It's a dense matrix, no assumptions on the no internal structure or anything. And uh, again, the matrices I'm talking about here are going to be off diagonal blocks in the direct solvers. It's not the whole system matrix I'm talking about. <coughs> So um, in this case, when A is stored just as an array of real numbers, it fits in RAM. In this case, the cost is dominated by steps 2 and 4. The cost here is MNK. It's the same as classical 
It's called Golub-Businger, this idea of constructing the basis by doing QR, for instance, doing gram schmidt for instance, on the columns of A. And uh, it has the same cost, but it turns out to be a bit more efficient because really it's, th these are blast three operations. They involve matrix, matrix multiplies. So There's less data movement, really, than in the classical one. So it can be implemented much more efficiently. But then uh, the perhaps stronger advantage is that you can actually reduce. So from MNK, you can go to MN log K. And the trick to doing that is that, uh, all right, so A is a general matrix. <laughs> but there's nothing that says that G has to be a general, just Gaussian random matrix. So I want G to be random enough that with high probability, it sufficiently mixes up the directions to give me an accurate algorithm. But I can actually, this actually leaves me some wiggle room. I can draw a random matrix that has enough structure that I can apply it randomly, uh, rapidly. So specifically, what we found very useful um, are things like subsampled Fourier transforms. So you can let G be some sort of FFT where you randomly draw just a number of coordinates. So you don't compute the full FFT. You just compute some randomly drawn components of the Fourier transform. And then you need to mix things up a little bit. There's some random diagonal preconditioners and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I won't go into details here, but uh, you can construct such random matrices that have enough structure that I can do the, this matrix matrix multiply. So this typically, it, this step and this step are typically the most expensive ones. So I, I can accelerate this one down to mn log k by using a structured random matrix. That still leaves me with this guy, but uh, I can do what I mentioned I can do in the single pass process. So I can, for instance, sample both the rows and the columns, or I can go to the interpolative decomposition. So notice that the algorithm for the ID here it doesn't involve the second step. There's really only one access to A in this case. So I, re I only touch A once. And then I execute the interpolative decomposition on this small matrix Y. And then I go back and I can just compute the K rows of A that I need. So cost is N K of that step. So we can get the cost down to M N log K and this is the kind of statement that you have to be very wary about. When people say, you know, I can reduce some asymptotic cost to log or something, well, you know, is the break-even point k equal to a million? In that case, it's not very useful. So let's uh, look at some numerical examples. So I'm going to compare primarily the time for classical goal abusing you to, so I, I call it the SR, SRFT method, subsampled random Fourier transform. So this is the randomized method where you use a structured random matrix. So it has complexity n squared times log k. So I'll compare it to the classical n squared times k method. And for fun, I'll also just throw in the basic method where you use the general random uh, Gaussian matrix. So that one has the same complexity as the classical method, but it's a little bit more efficient due to just communication. And then we'll also compare with the times compute the full SVD, which of course is n cubed for a square matrix. Yeah. So I'm guessing that the SRFT is only applicable when you really do have A sort of big complexity. Um, or one element or so that's more than A is a black box MacBook, for instance. I'm just guessing that if I'm applying some sort of structured calculation right. to multiply by the right by G, then I'm probably not able to do that structured multiply by the left. That's correct. But if you have a black box, then presumably that means that the cost of running the black box is less than n squared. So the, the objective here was really to deal with the case where I have no structure in A. Okay. All right, so here are the ratios between the costs. So these are really speed up factors. So one here corresponds to the classical, the textbook method. Uh, the left panel is a matrix of size 1,000 by 1,000. This is 2,000 by 2,000. This is 4,000 by 4,000. We 
implemented everything as carefully we can, you know, fully using BLAST2, BLAST3, where possible. Um, and these are the accelerations. So looking first at the blue line, so this is the acceleration in just the basic sampling using a Gaussian matrix. So it gives you roughly a factor of two in our implementations. And um, yeah, it, it's decent, but you lose a little bit of accuracy compared to properly doing Gram-Schmidt. So this is not perhaps that useful, but, uh, but the red line is the acceleration with the SRFT, with the structured random sampling. And the main bragging point on this slide is that you get big gains even for moderate size matrices. In fact, if we were to continue this going up, the gain would be better and better the larger problems I look at. So we get a factor of six speed up here in the best case. And uh, we always get, almost always get substantial speed ups. Right. So um, the other environment, so I mentioned that the Gaussian sampling algorithm, its advantage is that it's more communication efficient. So now look at a situation where communication completely dominates the computation. Say A is a very large matrix. It's stored on a hard drive, say it's, you know, it's a matrix of size 100,000 by 100,000 or a million by million or something you just cannot bring into the RAM. So in this case, like the entire computational time is dominated by steps two and four, just bringing A into memory is the entire cost of the algorithm. And notice that in this case, the randomized method is really doing extraordinarily well. It just, it's only two passes. I only need to look at each matrix element twice and they're accessed in basically any order that's dictated by the hardware. Whatever is most convenient to the hardware. If it's feeding the matrix column by column or however it's stored, you know, whereas if you do QR on the columns of the matrix, then you know, you have to first look at all the columns, you pick the largest one, then you need to go back or normalize, then look at the, which one is the largest now, pull it in, north normalize. It's, it's a tremendous amount of communication. And the final environment is uh, the situation where the main competitor is or null B or you know, various Krilov methods. So this is where you can execute the fast matrix vector multiply and uh, in this case, the cost is you need k basically matrix vector multiplies, and then you need processing of these dense matrices with k rows or columns. So the, sec the other steps have costs k square n plus n, and then you need k matrix vector multiplies, or 2k to be precise. So this cost is very similar to, uh, it's essentially the same as for Lanchos and Arnoldi. If you are lucky, you can run Lanchos or Arnoldi with just k instead of k squared over here, but that usually is too numerically unstable. So in principle, you only need to store a couple of vectors in certain variations of it, but typically you lose orthonormality, so in practice, they turn out to be k squared. So basically, the overall cost is the same, and this is, in this case, it's really problem dependent which one is the easier to use. So the randomized scheme, of course, has the advantage that you can process a whole bunch of vectors at once, whereas classical Krilo vectors throw one vector at a time. But, but this is not entirely true, because you can also construct modified Krilo methods that operate on blocks of vectors. So it, it's really quite problem dependent. Where you really don't want to use randomized methods is if you want very high accuracy on smaller singular values. So we will only get good accuracy on the largest singular values and corresponding singular vectors. Krilov methods, for instance, some of, in some environments, they converge on the smallest singular value, which can be very useful. Sometimes that's the one you want. In that case, you definitely don't want to use randomized sampling, unless you have some way of doing inverse iteration or something like this. But, uh, but this, this is much more of a gray zone. Sometimes one set of methods are better, sometimes the other one. And um, I think we'll save this for tomorrow. We're running out of time here. So tomorrow we're going to discuss errors a little bit in the randomized sampling method. And uh, we're going to discuss the issue of, well, what if the singular values don't decay rapidly? Then we're going to use a little bit of feedback 
use sort of Krylov type techniques uh, to restore good errors, uh, small errors. But uh, I think we're done for today. So we'll do that tomorrow, and then we're going to start talking about direct solvers with sparse matrices from finite difference and finite element discretizations. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>